Well, I haven't heard most of the, uh, the conference the last couple of days. I just arrived this morning. But uh, I see in the title the word sustainability. So can you all hear me if I just speak from here? No, you can't. OK, well, that answers that question. Um, let, me, let me just ask you. I was going to ask the previous speaker to engage me in a little conversation. But maybe I'll ask the previous, previous speaker, Beverly. Um, when you think of sustainability, what time scale do you think of? Do you think of, if, if you're a sportsman, you, if you're a sprinter, you probably think in terms of 10 seconds, right? You want to be able to sustain yourself over that 10 seconds, right? Uh, if, are, are you a mother by any chance? No? OK, if you were a mother, you would probably be thinking in terms of sustaining your family over what? Seconds, days, months, years? What? Decades? Maybe decades, right? So if you're a father or a mother, you're thinking in terms of, uh, gosh, my, I have to have the wherewithal to sustain my family over decades. Right? Very few of us think about great-grandchildren, right? Very few of us have great-grandchildren. Um, what about uh, governments? The, the government of Singapore, I've been here now six years, and my watching the government of Singapore, I would say that for the most part, they're trying to sustain the stability of the country over the coming year, but they certainly plan for decades. I don't think they're planning very much over the century. So, so most of us think of sustainability in terms of, of minutes, days, weeks. If we're a businessman, I, I imagine you guys think in terms of what? Uh, your careers? Maybe not in the same business. So maybe for a particular business, maybe five years, maybe 10 years. Um, as an earth scientist, what I can tell you is that you will probably continue to think of sustainability in, ter in those terms. If you're a, a sportsman in terms of the seconds or the minutes it requires you to get through an event successfully, sustainably. If you're a family, uh, if, you, if you run a family, decades. If you have a, a community, perhaps decades as well. Everything that we see in this room, from our iPhones to our chandeliers, are here because of agriculture. That's a strange statement, right? We, everything we hold dear in civilization, we hold dear because we've been able to have agriculture in the, over the last 10,000 years. Before that, we were all hunter-gatherers. We had no iPhones. We had no great inventions other than spears and, and so on. Um, since climate stabilized about 10,000 years ago, as the great ice sheets melted off of Canada and Fenoscandia, climate stabilized adequately didn't vary by more than about a global average temperature of a half a degree centigrade over the last 10,000 years, whereas before there would be swings of 10 degrees centigrade over courses of decades. So we couldn't actually have agriculture in a big way until about 10,000 years ago. And because we couldn't have agriculture until about 10,000 years ago, we couldn't become, not, we, we couldn't produce food, have farmers producing enough so that some of us could be scribes, some of us could be professors, some of us could be um, soldiers, some of us could be politicians. So agriculture is a sine qua non for everything that we see in this room today. And it's dependent upon climate stability. The irony of humanity over the last 200 years is that because of the Industrial Revolution and because of the Green Revolution in just the last 30 years, we've been able to produce enough food to support 7 billion people. And as my pre the previous speaker said, we're aiming at, we think we're aiming at 9 billion. And there are big challenges, some of which he pointed out potential solutions. The irony of humanity is that we have now destabilized the very thing that we depended upon to get ourselves from 2 billion people in 1930 to 7 billion people now to what we anticipate will be 9 billion people by 2050. So just to give you an example, some of my colleagues have calculated that if the great ice sheets that currently exist, Antarctica and Greenland, if they were actually in equilibrium with the amount of CO2 we've pumped into the atmosphere, mostly in the last 100 years, the seas would be 12 meters higher than they are today. That's if we give the ice sheets enough time to equilibrate with the current levels of CO2. So somewhere in our future, probably within the next 500 years or so, most of Singapore will be gone. The 
The government allowed me to initiate uh, the Earth Observatory of Singapore six years ago because it had a, a sense that the better they understood what the natural world is going to deliver over the next 30 years, 40 years, 100 years, the more likely they'd be able to adapt and to survive. One example of that is a, a Singaporean example that you probably don't know about because we just discovered it. You all know about the 2004 tsunami that wiped out the lives of 250,000 people throughout the Indian Ocean, 230 in, in Aceh, northern, northern Indonesia, northern Sumatra. We've just discovered evidence that a previous society living along that coast and very important for the maritime silk route from Arabia all the way to China was wiped out in 1394 by the previous tsunami. And I was going to bring a piece of Yuan Dynasty pottery to show you that this was owned by somebody who didn't anticipate that event. Likewise, in 2004, no one anticipated the event that killed a quarter million people. What we think we found is that, if you know the history of the, of the Straits, the Malacca Straits, Malacca and Singapore began to thrive in about 1400. So somebody was fleet of foot when the previous culture along the coast of Aceh was wiped out by the previous tsunami, somebody thought, you know what, let's settle someplace a little more safe, so let's go to Malacca, and let's build up Malacca, and let's go to Temasek, previous name of Singapore, and build up Singapore. So, so those two places must have had some entrepreneurial sorts who thought, well, let's just be a little safer, let's move over here, let's build up our societies, and, and the rest is history. Malacca, you all know, is a great place to go, was a great place for the Portuguese to try to conquer. So, so my point is this. My point is that the, the more you know about what's on the horizon, and the further you can see to that horizon, the more likely you are to be able to adapt to what's going to happen during what we geologists are now calling the Anthropocene. So the previous 10,000 year period of climate stability we called the Holocene. And we assumed, when I was a grad student, we assumed it would go on forever. That we'd only have to deal with things like little ice ages that uh, precipitated the French Revolution or the, the great uh, decade-long drought that ended the Ming Dynasty or that ended the uh, Tang Dynasty or ended the Yuan Dynasty. But in fact, those little half degree centigrade changes that helped to precipitate political instability, they in fact, are, are going to be dwarfed by the challenges we face as we go into the Anthropocene. So my guess is, I see a time's up signal here. I don't read English, uh, just, just 30 seconds. Um, I think that we're never going to, to stop doing what we evolve, evolved to do in terms of, under, of, of our concept of sustainability. We're going to be, always be thinking in terms of a, a, a couple of years or a decade, or two decades or three if we're particularly visionary. Those of us who do well, those communities, those governments, those societies that do well in the coming centuries will do well if they have a, a greater view of the, of the horizon, a better view of the horizon of what's on tap in terms of change in climate, uh, earthquake potential, volcanic ash over aviation, uh, over flight uh, paths and so on, um, than those who don't have that vision. So that's just a, basically a subtle sales pitch for those of us who are scientists Please keep in touch with us and, uh, and uh, find out what we're learning about uh, what's on the horizon with regard to climate and all sorts of other geohazards over the next 50 years. Thank you.